the series Paula sorry uh, <laughs> Let me start again. So it is a pleasure to welcome our final talk in the series, Paula Rego and her contemporaries. Uh, the exhibition is still ongoing. So if you haven't seen it already, you can book tickets online on the European Parliament's uh, Liaison Office website. It is open until the 16th of July. Um, last week, we heard from Cliff Andrade one of the selected artists in what proved to be a very deep and insightful session. Uh, Cliff was joined by Mara and Catherine Zanz. Uh, this week, we have the pleasure of being joined by Elena Kripa, Maria Manuel Lisboa, known as Manusha, and Catarina Alfaro, uh, as well uh, as our wonderful curator, Mara Alves. Uh, I'll, click it, I'll quickly say a few words to introduce our panel, then I'll leave the floor to them. So Mara Alves is the curator of Paula Rego and her contemporaries. She's a contemporary art curator from Lisbon, currently studying an MA in art history at the University of London. Her platform, Portugal, aims to promote Portuguese culture internationally and she has curated an array of art projects in London, including for Caspia Contemporary Gallery, the Dragon Gallery, Start Art Fair, and at the Contemporary Gallery, where she was the chief curator for three years. Elena Kripa is the Tate's curator of modern and contemporary British art. She studied curating contemporary arts at the Royal College of Art before completing her PhD at the London Construction and Thoughts Exhibition Studies at Central St. Martins. She's currently curating uh, Paula Rego Retrospective at the Tate that opens next month. Uh, and we'll run into the autumn, which we are very excited about. Uh, Maria Manuel Lisboa is a professor of Portuguese literature and culture at St. John's College in Cambridge. Her specialities include 19th century literature and visual arts with a particular focus on gender, religion, and national identity. She has published two books on Paula, the most recent being Essays on Paula Rego, Smile When You Think About Hell, from 2019. And Catarina Alfaro is the chief curator at the Casa das Historias Paula Rego. She studied history of art at Nova University in Lisbon, where she went on to do a master's and then a doctorate. She was a researcher and curator at the Carlos Gulbenkian Foundation. Um, so uh, I hope you enjoy this session, this last session of our, of our series. Thank you. Thank you, Adriana. Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. And a, spe a special thanks to Catarina Maria Manuel Lisboa, which, who we can call from now on Manusha. <laughs> And uh, Elena, thank you so much for, um, for accepting to participate in this talk today. Um, so, so I guess that um, we, we shall start by, uh, um, uh, I will explain briefly that we will be seeing some, some of the selected works that uh, uh, are on show at the moment. So I've selected 11 graphic works from Paulo Rego. And, um, and I guess that a good starting point would be around this specific technique and its unique expression from Paul de Rego's oeuvre. Um, and so I would start by um, asking um, you um, how important do you think it is for Paul de Rego's works and her creative practices, this specific technique? Difficult to know who should go first. <laughs> uh, maybe I can just begin by saying something about the context of studies of Paula. Um, she was a student at the Slay School of Fine Art in the mid fifties. And what is very interesting about that context is that printmaking by then was not considered, considered 
um, a sort of primary activity, painting and sculpture more truly the foremost activities that an artist should have the ambition to work with. And um, printmaking was truly considered a sort of secondary activity that artists did when they didn't find space in the life room or as a secondary practice, mm -hmm. which is of course a real shame because it's such a rich, uh, mm -hmm. activity with such a long history. Likely at the Slade School of Fine Arts, they had an incredible head of department, uh, Anthony Gross, who was a really fine etcher and someone who had studied, especially in Paris, when the tradition of etching had such a long history. And the printing department at the Slade was very important for many artists, um, particularly quite a few female artists who felt the live room was a very competitive space where mm -hmm painters had to sort of uh, spend off and, and also we need to think um, studying at that particular time in the early 50s was particularly tough. Uh, Paula was a very young artist and at the time there was a very large number of uh, male artists who had received scholarships to study once they had returned from the army. So you had all these really mature artists who had to prove themselves and many uh, artists have commented that the etching, the printing rooms were in a way a, a very special place which allowed a more intimate, less exposed way of working. When you drew or painted in the live room, it was in a way quite performative. You were doing it in front of everyone while printing was a much more private activity. And I think what is very interesting is that also later on, uh, Paula described printmaking in, in this manner as something that allows you to step back from the sort of drama of the large piece of paper or canvas and a much more intimate activity of looking in. Uh, and she also has described it as this activity that she very much enjoyed doing between paintings as a way of working on a different format uh, of looking in rather than looking out. And she used this beautiful word, she said it's like diving into the sea after having been out in the sun uh, for a long period of time. So this sort of change of tone and pace. And I think while she didn't use printmaking for a, a long period in her career, she did so at this late and for a few years later um, in the, into the early 60s, and then very much returned to it in the 80s, proving herself uh, technically truly extraordinary both at printmaking in all different aspects of etching and using aqua tint and lithographs. So yeah, just a, an introduction in terms yeah. of the setting of her learning. That's also, I, I think Paula, um, um, for Paula, the, the process of engraving is also a path of continuity that enable her to recover the link to the automatic process that the practice of drawing is for her. Um, and it is since her childhood, a process that to a certain extent she interrupted in the early 90s. So um, is she, she, she said so many times that is a process a very, with a very physical component uh, that, and she explains that the resistance of the support calls for enables her to concentrate and confront herself with the infinite possibilities of this technique, with the story being developed as a response to the formal elements that she decides to be drawing and inscribe on, on the plate. So for her, it's a very, she likes very much the incisiveness of the drawing and this physical experience. So mm -hmm. um, that's fascinating. It's almost like a self-absorbing uh, practice. It's, it's uh, very private and it, it is a difficult one. So it, it really requires you to be um, concentrated on what you are doing. Mm -hmm. That's really fascinating. Yeah. And especially because when, once you are doing, once you are engraving, you always need to, to, to make sure that you know at what you are doing and and playing with the light and, and shadows when you are engraving because uh, once it is printed it will be reversed right so yeah um it is it is a very um interesting technique yes definitely thank you thank you so much um 
As she going back to what Elena was saying about her beginnings at the Slade, I think it's very important. And I think it does, I suspect it might have defined the way Paula Hick turned out to be. Um, I always think of that song by Jarvis Cocker, uh, Common People, which talks mm -hmm. about a, a rich girl uh, writing to study art at the Slade School and the, the voice of the, uh, the male singer. Is very patronizing. You know, this is a rich girl, so I'm going to, you know, have sex with her, and then get her to pay for my drinks. And he doesn't take her seriously at all. Um, and I'm always um, reminded of the story that I've heard many people, including Nick Willing, her son, um, uh, telling of when uh, Victor Willing was already um, uh, one of the great white hopes of. Uh, young Brit art, and uh, Paolo would go with him to openings and shows, and people would ask her, uh, so Paula, are you still dabbling as well? Um, and um, she she's now enormously successful, but I think if you become very successful in your late 40s, having been patronized like that until then, I don't know you, you get over it. I would not get over it if I'd been that patronized, that dismissed. For most of my adult life, well, until my uh, late 40s. So I think a lot of the anger that I detect in her work, I think has to be linked um, to those biographical components as well. So back to the, her days in the slate um, and ever after, until of course she became so massive that now no one can patronize her. Yes, exactly. <laughs> That's a good point, very good point. <laughs> Thank you, Manusha, really good. Um, and yes, we, we will definitely talk about her, um, uh, about her starting because she did struggle a lot um, at the beginning. So that, that's a good point out for us to also discuss um, continuing um, this conversation. Uh, so I'll start by showing, um, so the first piece that we have on show, uh, which is a very special piece. Um, so first of all, it is the first time that this piece is being shown. Um, so the, the top one is, is the actual uh, plate um, that resulted in the, in the bottom work. So this is called La Mano Muerta. And this is uh, the top one, a plate that uh, Paula drawn in around 1962-64. Uh, so she drawn this plate in London and then she brought this plate with her to her uh, family house in Portugal, uh, where she had to hit uh, this work. Um, because uh, at the time uh, we were living under Salazar regime. Um, and so because she was already doing some, some works against uh, fascism, um, the SNE were threatening to uh, search her studio. So she had to hit this plate. And uh, fortunately, uh, it was discovered last year and recovered, restored and, and printed now into this, uh, this edition. For, for us all to, to see and appreciate. So this is a, um, a very special piece because of the story behind it as well. And, and because it addresses defiance against uh, oppression. And while we, we do still experience other types of oppression still today in the 21st century, but I guess that now my, my next question to you would be um, how relevant uh, in your opinion is Paulo's work in the contemporary world. So this is for you three, feel free to, to engage. Well, I suppose you'd, you'd have to ask um, the fellow artists uh, <laughs> around the world. <laughs> um, uh, I, I think you, know, you don't become this important a name in uh, the field of the visual arts without having an enormous influence on your contemporaries, whether they like you or don't like you or your work. Um, I think um, she's what we in Portuguese like to call incontournable, um, unavoidable now, uh, certainly yes. for Portuguese artists, but <laughs> in, in, in for British artists as well. Now, after all, uh, she's having this massive retrospective in Tate Britain, which uh, signals her importance, her visibility, uh, unforgettability, if that word exists. So, of, of course, whether you um, uh, acknowledge that effect or not, I think she's got to be 
an important presence, I would say. Yes, yes, yes. I agree, and especially I, I think that well, I've been I've been saying this um, a lot, but I do believe that um, um, her work is is also intemporal in a way. So it doesn't matter if it was done uh, 20, 30 years ago. It seems like um, it's very much current, uh, especially the subjects, some subjects that that Paula addresses as well, um, and that is um, quite important as well. Uh, in our in our uh, current days. Yeah. Thank you, Manusha. Um, okay, so I guess that we can move to to the next one. So I'm showing the the works as they are on display. So they are displayed in a chronological way as well um, at the exhibition. Um, and so the secrets and stories. So this is a very playful um, uh, piece. And it's 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 a simple one. It's children playing in, in and it represents their their unique uh, world. Um, and so, um, what I find uh, most of the times when looking at Paula's work is uh, I always get this sense of double meaning um, um, in between the the most um, simple works and the most provocative works works as well. So I would ask if you if if you think that um, there's there's this double meaning between the um, this the 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 symbolic um, imaginary and reality uh, in, in Paul's work as well. I think we we have to this double meaning is always present um, in um, in the the fairy tales and in uh, the and of course Paula Rego um, uh, is unique on the way that she takes on on tales as a testament to a particular context in which in which she grew up rebelling against suffocating dictatorship persecution and um, Paula Rego and in this. Um, uh, engraving, you can see uh, a girl reading to another um, a big, a huge book. And for me, uh, it remembers me um, the relation that she had, for example, with um, Gustave Doré, the illustrations of From the Hell. Uh, and that was, she describes it as something magical that. Um, it was always present this kind of enchantment with the fairy tales and the illustrations from the fairy tales is always present in, in her work. And uh, because she's aware of the subversive poten potential of, of tales. Um, and, and I look for an interview um, and to where she tells that uh, folk tales uh, show human nature as it is, without being corrupt by the idea of how it should be, or any sentimentality. People think that children should be protected from the cruelty in these stories, but they don't. They do not care. They like it because they understand them very well. So I think Paula uh, is is very aware of this subversive uh, potential of the, the tales and the fairy tales in which we grow up. So it is so important to her. And this engraving for me, it's, it's like, it's the secrets and the stories that are hidden in this, um, in this um, kind of uh, story. So in fairy tales, particularly in folk tales. Yeah, that's interesting. Very interesting, Katarina. Thank you. Do you want to say anything, Elena? Oh, no, I just wanted to add that, you know, just looking at this particular print, um, I absolutely agree with everything that's been said, but to me, there is also something extraordinary about two things that really struck me looking at this image is Paula's capacity to render the nuances of uh, gestures and the way we use our bodies to express emotions 
And this, is, I think, is something that she was extraordinary since a teenager, since even before starting art school. This capacity to visualize uh, our nonverbal language and the way she depicts these gestures, micro gestures, these expressions. And the other, to me, is the just extraordinary gentleness of her drawing. And this is, to me, particularly true of her small scale drawing. And this moment in the late 80s when she returned to um, drawing from life. And you can really see how attentive she is to the, the gestures, the, the, the expressions. And I, I think it, in her drawings to me more than in her painting, you really have that extraordinary, you know, sense of, yeah, there is something really gentle and um, different to what you have in the painting when it's maybe transforming and like elevating in a more stage and theatrical way. And I think it's something that maybe we notice less about her works, but I certainly see in some of the small scale work, particularly works like this one. Yeah, that's true. That's true. And it's something that um, you, you kind of see more specifically in this type of um, technique that Paula uses um, as well. That uh, attention um, to detail, uh, um, yeah, it is very present in her graphic work. Yeah, thank you. Um, okay, so I think that we can move to the next one. So the next one is um, him. And this work was uh, inspired by a poem uh, written by Morrison and uh, called, the poem is called The Ballad of the Yorkshire Reaper, published in 1987. Um, and so this is a, a, a human male has predator. So half human, half animal. Um, it's a striking image, but especially on what I wanted to, to focus on, on this specific work is precisely the, the, the female figure and the powerful, um, gaze because she doesn't seem scared um, or struggling and so I believe there's there's the, the strong feminist um, uh, message across not only this work but the next ones that we will see as well um, and um, I, I wanted to, to what would you say um, about how Paula represents these women in such strong um, um, settings and and uh, and such powerful um, gazes. Um, well, one of the things that um, always strikes me about not just it, this image, which is wonderful, um, uh, but almost all uh, Paula Hill's images that are depicted from prior narratives, for example, The Maids, yeah. that uh, was taken from a play by Jean Genet, which itself was taken from a real life event of two maids in Paris who murdered their mistress. Um, uh, obviously, the Yorkshire Reaper in the late 70s, early 80s, who killed an awful lot of women, um, uh, mainly prostitutes, but not only, um, um, and which was uh, obviously uh, immortalized in The Ballad of the Yorkshire Reaper uh, by Blake Morrison, is that um, Paula seems to take often narratives uh, and him to Padre Maru, the crime of Father Maru, Asad Kedos, um, where women, and she takes narratives where women are hurt um, uh, or killed, but in her images, they're not. Um, they, um, she reverses that out, the, those outcomes. So the women that you'd expect to be killed, um, uh, hurt, um, uh, eliminated, oppressed in any way, in her work are not. It's almost as though, she, as though she can't bear to hurt women. She can't bear to depict female um, uh, uh, defeat or, or, or destruction. So she, it's like she takes stories where the woman is in the original very badly hurt or murdered or destroyed in some kind of way, and she turns it on its head and they're no longer that. So you're quite right that here, um, we don't get the impression that um, uh, this werewolf figure might be the Yorkshire Reaper or um, some figure of horror or fantasy. Uh, we don't get the impression that he's going to come out of it the winner. She's going to come out of it the winner. Mm -hmm. uh, 
so there's at least that possibility that way you would expect to see a wounded woman or wounded female, you have the opposite, you've got a triumphant woman and the wounded attacker. I think that it's a kind of a very, there is an ambiguity in this image because uh, between violence, weirdness and seduction with the victim's consent. It's, uh, and Paula always, uh, sh sometimes she introduces this ambiguity that is very, well, uh, for us is, is shocking sometimes. And, um, and the fact that she uses this uh, humanized animal, it's also important because this uh, Paula, some, she puts um, these animals, these hybrids, and situations of power and seduction, assuming uh, the form of sometimes benignant and sometimes they are frightening. And this occurs in some of Paula's uh, nursery rhymes also. Uh, and it's very, um, there is always this ambiguity. Uh, we don't know if it's a seduction scene of is something more. Uh, it's like a, an enchantment situation that Paula always um, she creates this complex universe uh, with the idea of the transfiguration with animals and and humans and everything gets more complicated and more strange and weird and which is the case um with uh, a lot of images like we're going to get to the abortion image at some point so yeah. i won't play that. but a lot of those images um could be confused for uh, standard uh, depictions of uh, seduction for example the one yeah. on the uh, right hand corner yeah we know this is a picture of, uh, about abortion, but it could be a picture of sexual invitation, sexual ecstasy, pleasure. So she does play those games with posture and ambiguity, like uh, Katerina says. Yeah, that's true. That's very true. And I think the other thing that she does, which is very important, and, and this for me was very fascinating to see she does already in the late 50s. She, you know, one of her key strategies is to empower women through their sexuality and in making their sexuality overt and fully embodied and trusting them forward. And this is extraordinary to think as an operation she was able to do so early on when really we are looking at the really beginning of the feminist movement and so few, few women were making pictures in which uh, you had female characters who were sexually empowered. Mm -hmm. um, and this I think is one of the earliest and most extraordinary contributions of Paula Riga. And we can think of so many painters, female painters of course, particularly who came after her, who I believe were able to build on uh, you know, Paula's achievements, that sort of courage to step into this territory and empower women sexually. And, and I think it's very interesting, she did say, um, she read uh, the Beauvoir Second Sex when she was at Slade, so we are looking at the early to mid 50s. And she simply said, I simply agreed with all of it. <laughs> but you know, that sort of capacity to truly understand the position of women and then in a way you know reverted and create these images for a role of women that still didn't exist in society because the position of women was not uh, particularly precarious in Portugal even in the UK you know abortion was not legal women had not a freedom to decide on their body fully at all. So I think it was what she was doing really mattered enormously, not just in Portugal, but uh, also in the UK and beyond. Yes, that's true. Yes. Um, actually, um, this, this uh, sorry, Manusha, uh, these three, these three um, uh, etchings that we are seeing now are part of, of series that she did for an exhibition in Portugal. 
but responding precisely to the to the Portuguese abortion referendum. So uh, the subject around abortion and 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 the way that that uh, she so vividly conveys uh, this this powerful uh, meaning and but at the same time the freedom um, that we can we can almost be uh, within these settings or be. Uh, these these women at the, at the same time, so so yes, I, I was uh, I was wondering. So these these etchings um, then also in a smaller scale, and uh, because because she did develop a series around around the abortion uh, thematic, they could be seen as also um, in a way uh, could be more accessible and reach more people. So it's all. It could work almost like a, a, a propaganda uh, showing her point of view as well. So, um, in your perspective, I, you, you've you've also responded uh, to this, Elena. But how important was that at the time, and and how important it is today? So, if we could, can bring that subject for our to our current days. I will defer to Manucha because she knows so much. On this yes, subject. yes, yes, of course. And I interrupted you, Manucha, sorry. <laughs> no, 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 not at all. No, go, Elena, because I think the question was mainly to you. I can talk later. Go ahead. Oh, no, it's okay. You can, I mean, any of you can, can talk. <laughs> um, well, um, sorry, I, if you ask how important was it making this upfront, um, well, I was fascinated when the the abortion untitled pictures first came out. The Portuguese catalog uh, managed the miracle of not mentioning abortion at all in talking about the images, which was stunning. Mm -hmm. And um, not a mention of the topic of the images at all, which I found shocking. You know, it's almost an affront to what this artist was doing to, you know, sweep. And it, this was. 1988, this image, 99, sorry, 99. Um, and you think, no, it, that's right, it's also the abortion reference, I mean, in, um, that she did in response to this. And um, the idea that you could produce a catalog about images about abortion and not mention the word abortion at all was classic to me of hypocrisy and the desire to sweep things on the carpet, which again takes us back to Blake Morrison, who I think is one of the reasons Paula Hick likes him so much is that he does address head on uh, the violence of men against women in uh, Moth, which is another, another poem that Paula Hick also was inspired by, and it's a picture of that um, um, title um, uh, about the ballad of. Uh, Yorkshire Rip and, and the image that came out of that. And um, I think given that she's such an upfront artist, you know, you can't avoid what she's doing. It always shocks me how people go round about these inconvenient aspects of her work and try not to see them or, or talk about them. That's very true indeed, Manusha. On that point, actually, Manush, I also read um, an interview um, that Paula gave saying how bizarre it was to be at an opening soon after the work was produced and exhibited and seeing women visitors clearly recognizing themselves in the pictures and being deeply affected by them and then hearing the men discuss them in terms of the formalism and yes. uh, which clearly is there. They are in a way very formally striking work by the fact that those men uh, visitors could only address the subjects, I guess also speaks very much to your comments. Yeah. That's true. Well, uh, building on that, uh, I would like to ask Manusha, um, uh, how was it for you to, to research and, and write about Paula's work? Um, and uh, I would like you to share your, your contribution and, um, and uh, um, how, how was it uh, relevant also on, on a personal level um, to be able to develop and write about Paula's work? Um, 
Well, it's funny to start with my work on politics starts with her turning me down. <laughs> <laughs> um, because when, at one point when I'd already come to Cambridge, the University of Cambridge to, to teach, I thought of inviting her to give a talk here about her work. And she said, um, um, well, I don't like talking about my work. Why don't you talk about my work? And then um, she just, um, I just written a book on Esther Kedosh. Um, and she just finished, she was just finishing her series based on the crime of Father Maru, Prince Father Maru. So it was like the heavens had opened up and angels came down and sang to me. So I went and she said, well, I got to give a, a talk to at the opening of the exhibition. So that's how it started. It started with literature, um, which often for Paula is where it starts as well whether it's nursery rhymes or Kafka or, or uh, Esad Kedosh or, um, or the many, many works she's done that um, have been derived from literature. Uh, that's how it started. Um, to me, everything that she does speaks to um, things that have always concerned me. I, I am a feminist. Um, I'm a woman. Um, I exist in a world that treats women quite badly on a regular basis. Um, um, and it's impossible, like Paula Hicks' reaction when she read Simone Beauvoir, The Second Sex, um, uh, everything she does speaks to me because we've mm -hmm. all been there. Um, whether you've walked down the street and you're afraid um, because a figure like him might come up behind you and do something terrible to you, or um, whether, um, you've been um, put down or, or uh, overlooked or, or not even been given a feeling of um, uh, recognition, which I, you know, I suppose I can't complain too much about that, but it doesn't have to be about you personally. You see what's going around to other women as well. Uh, it's impossible for her work not to speak to women. Um, and what um, uh, um, Elena said about the man talking about the technical aspects of her work and the women here, oh, that's me, or oh, that's my daughter, or my sister, or my uh, grandmother, or whatever, um, in that position. I think it's, it's there. Um, it's impossible. So her work, in her work, the political not to be personal as well. Yes, yes, that's definitely true. Uh, her work is are always um, uh, can be always powerful statements and and should question and and change mindsets definitely. The women she makes me think about most when I look at her work at my grandmothers. <laughs> oh, because of women of that generation who had no option but yes. to be what they were told they had to be. And Paula looks much older than my grandmother would be, much younger than my grandmother would be. But my God, she understood that generation of women in Portugal like nobody else. Yes, definitely we can relate. I mean, especially I, I can relate when, when looking at uh, past generations in my, even my parents or my grandparents. Um, yes, definitely. You can. There's. You can definitely resonate um, the, the message and and the feeling, especially being a woman yeah, and all the the, um, the challenges. Yeah. Thank you, Manusha. Thank you so much. So so we can we can now move to to the next one that we that is on show, which is Scarecrow. This beautiful and colorful lithograph. Um, and so, so this, this is inspired by the playwright uh, Mar Martin McDonald. Um, and in uh, Paula's perspective, this plays, uh, this play meddles with, with religion and it has um, also uh, the connection of the little girl, girl who wanted to be Jesus, um, also very much connected with, with somehow the Portuguese culture. Um, and um, so, so he has a religious um, thematic here, which, which I will leave to, to the next ones um, that we will show next. Um, and then now these very two disturbing works that I really wanted to um, show you and talk to you about. Um, so we have 
on the left side we have uh, Night Bride, uh, which is a work, uh, part of a series uh, dedicated to fem female genital mutilation. And then on the right side we have uh, Dead Girls Shopping, which, which is about trafficking um, subject. Um, and so these, these, these images are quite uh, disturbing in the way that um, they convey how uh, children uh, are treated and, and uh, traded almost uh, as objects and uh, subject to controversial beliefs. Um, and uh, there's so much going on here. And these, these again, are very disturbing images, but uh, address uh, real problematics and and current problematics that we still we're still facing today. Um, so I I wanted I would like you to to share about the um, the social impacts from these realities and and your perspective around these two works. But I might just begin by saying that I think what is extraordinary is that Paula made these works when she was already 74, 75. And this again is something that I, I, I think there is a really interesting red thread in the way she operated across the decades since, certainly since the sixties at least, in the way she responded in a really direct ways to reading or listening to the news and becoming, you know, listening to very specific episodes that um, mistreated all sorts of people, including workers who had to work in poor conditions, uh, even dogs, you know, the Dogs of Barcelona uh, collage from the 60s, but of course, particularly women. And I think this is one of the really extraordinary things that Paula does. She she heard this, you know, and including the abortion, she reads the news and she experiences this incredible pathos and rage and empathy. And then she injects it into her work. I think this is very much the origins of a considerable number of her work, including this series, when she responded to just reading and hearing about, you know, all these uh, constant events where women are abused. And something that certainly she is extraordinary, extraordinary at is hitting at the moment where women are both the victims, but also the perpetrators mm -hmm. and exploring the very fine line whereby women in order to continue social norms and habits and, uh, you know, sort of, allow society to continue in the way in which has been constructed effectively end up hurting their own children, their own daughters, uh, the people they love. And I think this relationship, you know, that she experienced in, in certain ways growing up herself, when, you know, looking at women effectively damaging their daughters in order to preserve social norms in order not to denounce abuse, in order not to, uh, you know, point the finger at pedophiles and rapists and so on, has contributed to this history of continuous abuse. And what I find particularly extraordinary about Night Bride is that you have this figure that looks like mother sitting down. And for me, that figure is really heartbreaking because, is you know, she's, clearly a loving, caring mother, but she's also someone who is witnessing or enabling mm. uh, the mutilation to, takes to take place. And, and she really, you know, has that capacity to explore the, the very fine boundaries of love and abuse in all sorts of different settings. And I just would say one more thing about Night Bride because it's been read in many different ways. And again, I think this is something that Paula herself, you know, offers as an invitation and enables different reading. But for me, what is very interesting about this picture is that we are looking both at the child and this child we have seen in other pictures, she was a victim, but also there is this 
uh, skeletal, monstrous woman who lies on the table. Who in certain pictures, he is the person performing oppression, mutilating the girl, but he also seems to be the victim. And I think, again, this I think is really one of these key pictures in which she has, she's pinpointing not just the relationship between victims and perpetrators, but also the perpetrators are often victims themselves. And yeah, I just think it's an incredibly difficult, but also incredibly moving picture. And uh, that really visualizes something that is so often, or so rarely, sorely discussed. And again, you know, it's that pushing for making visible the invisible. And I think that very feminist notion that is only by making visible and speaking about abuse that we can begin doing something to address it and, and do it. Yeah. Yes, I completely agree with Elena. Um, um, uh, uh, and it fits into uh, possibly the last picture, Escape. Uh, escape, escape um, yes. Yes. Um, I can uh, put it up. Yes. And this is a completely yeah, in contrast. Because, well, but it's funny because when I saw this, um, and it's one of the. Um, uh, genital mutilation yes, pictures. Yes, part of the. I same. thought exactly what Elena had been talking about. I thought how interesting because mainly, terribly in in the practice of genital mutilation, the mothers collude in you know doing this to their daughter. So how nice that here we have a mother uh, that's not colluding, or maybe she is. Maybe she's carrying her daughter uh, to the place where this can be done. To her. It's very, again they. Uh, imponderable, but um, it what Elena said was exactly what occurred to me when I saw this. And I thought, I hope this is the mother taking her daughter away, rather than the mother taking her daughter to have it done to her, because yeah. mostly it's mothers, you know, colluding in um, what's expected of women, of girls. Yeah, that's true. I think it is. It is um, has always very brave um, uh, of, of Paula to to constantly um, uh, depict what disturbs her, but uh, above all, it disturbs um, all of us, um, especially uh, when we, we do not share the same beliefs or the same culture has these um, specific um, thematics. Um, so I wanted to just go back to the previous one. So this one, Lamentation. So uh, here we have, we have um, uh, so there's, there's the, the, the speaking of pillow men uh, in many works from Paula has a religious team. And so this brings, brings us back also to the scarecrow. And uh, we know that Paula is not a religious uh, person. So I wanted you to share your, your perspective around, around uh, the religious teams that, uh, that Paula develops and, and uh, what in your perspe perspective do they convey in terms of critical thinking or, or purpose? And obviously this is very uh, our own perspective. We don't have Paula here to, 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 to talk to us about that, but it, it is what you, what you can see here, you know. I think uh, Paula describes herself as, uh, well, at this time, as a religious woman, actually. Uh, but um, reading some, um, I, in Casa das Stories, we, we have now um, an exhibition about a religious work, precisely. Mm -hmm. And okay. um, I read some of her interviews um, where she talks about this relation with Catholic religion. And she says that what, when she was very young, um, she felt uh, an appealing to the mystery of the religion. Uh, the things that she could not, uh, that could not be um, explained in naturalistic terms. So. Again, the mystery is, is very important to uh, work. And um, she also uh, made some um, works that are related 
some paintings related with with the Catholic religion. First in 1991 for the National Gallery, Grivelli's Garden, and uh, again she what interested what what she felt that was more appealing was to she lists a series of film, female character characters representing them in a position of superiority in relation to men. I, I'm talking about the saints, Saint Catherine, uh, Mar uh, that sometimes they, they the, the martyrs from the uh, Catholic uh, narrative. And she subverts um, in this painting, again, the place uh, of the aggressors and the victims. For example, Saint, Saint Catherine, she's um, um, she's um, uh, immobilizing a torture, which is supposed to be uh, the Emperor Maxentium. So, uh, and the explanation that she gives is she's she didn't kill him. It's only symbolized the triumph of, of spirit. It's a revenge. But at the same time, she, she doesn't need to kill him. Uh, and uh, again, Paula will, um, in 2002, she will uh, make uh, scenes from the life of the Virgin Mary to uh, the chapel of Nossa Senhora de Belém in Palacio de Belém, which is the residence of the, our president. So uh, Paula, um, what she, um, the uniqueness of these works came from the unusual look uh, from and of the feminine, uh, the way that Paula chose to represent Virgin Mary, it's truly, uh, it has a truly human dimension. Um, and it's very interesting to see all that paintings that we can only see there because Paula doesn't allow that the paintings came from the chapel. They, they were done specifically for this uh, chapel. And um, they are very strong. And again, they, they, um, the image of um, ma uh, Christ's mother is, is very real and very understandable for us. And we can feel all the pain uh, specifically uh, in, in the scene of the birth, but so also when uh, Jesus dies. So it's very, very, um, it's a kind, for us, I think she, she, she turns very, um, it's very human that suffering um, and they are different kind of, of image that we are used to see uh, because um, also because Mary, uh, the mother of Christ, has, she has an active participation uh, in the death of, of her son. So it's uh, very interesting to see those pictures because we can feel uh, the pain of the, this mother. And she, she, she is very... Um, She's like any other mother, and Paula can't capture this, this feeling, this anguish, and it's very. Yeah, that's a very fascinating thing. Yes, and and I mean, speaking from my own experience, I can relate uh, being brought within the catalog, I uh, catalog, cat. Oh my God, religious. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, uh, it, it is. Uh, at some point you start making all these questions about about uh, suffering and, and sacrifice and so it is interesting to see this uh, and by the way Katarina now that you were um, sharing with with us uh, the current exhibition I would also like you to talk a bit about um, your own work at Casa das Histórias so a museum in Portugal uh, House of Stories translated uh, so you've been the chief curator there since 2010. And so I would like you to share with us uh, um, how was it, how it has been um, developing the um, uh, arts uh, educational programs and exhibitions. 
and I was also curious uh, about how do you uh, program and prepare the ex exhibitions if you have in mind or try to keep present narratives between Paulus, Paulo Rego's works and the other artists that will be showing as well? Well, um, since the beginning, the construction of Casa das Histórias, the museum, uh, we, uh, I made the calc, uh, the, uh, I count 22 exhibitions uh, since the beginning. And uh, we, um, these exhibitions uh, are different uh, because they must be different because it's, it's, um, it's a monographic museum dedicated to only one artist. Uh, and sometimes it's, we have to imagine other kind of exhibitions uh, rather than uh, particularly exposing works from the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, the 90s. It's, well, something else, uh, we have to do something else. And of course, the, we sometimes try to establish a close relationship with uh, works with, by other artists linked to our figurative universe. Um, and at this time we have at Casa das Histórias an exhibition um, uh, about uh, Josefa Diobic, um, the religious works, but also some specific relations that we can uh, establish with Paulo's works. Um, and um, we also made some uh, exhibitions, for example, um, focused on the technique. We had an exhibition of uh, graphic work, but our main purpose um, is to show the public the multidimensionally multi of Paulo Rego's work, because it's so uh, recognizing that uh, our work has no boundaries uh, and it, it's not limited to the field of visual arts. Um, we, uh, because she constantly uh, engages in crossovers with other artistic manifestations such as theater, cinema, literature, poetry, and our culture, our educative program make these links, bringing some aspects of these, um, these other disciplines and uh, to try to, to engage with Paulo Rego with another perspectives. So uh, I think um, our work is so vast and so that we have to, our exhibitions are, are not, uh, are always in constant progress. And we also make our, uh, an investigation about um, a work from the 60s. We are making the catalogue raisonné and the research is also a very important um, uh, focus of the museum. So, well, you are doing a brilliant uh, work. Uh, it's I will leave the the link in the chat um, shortly. So, if anyone anyone that is not familiar with the museum should definitely have a look. Um, you are always um, have developing some some very interesting uh, programs. Um, thank you, Katarina, thank for you. that. Um, so I guess that um, we, we could uh, probably open the floor to anyone who has questions. Uh, just make sure to, you can leave them in the chat or you can raise your hands. Um, any questions are welcome. And while we are waiting, I would like to ask Elena about the exciting retrospective that's it's about to open at the Tate Britain, which was um, uh, installed, uh, finally finalized the installation today, right? We were just talking about that. So I wanted to ask you about um, the, the behind the scenes process. Um, so how long <laughs> are you preparing this retrospective um, challenges that uh, you faced, especially during the pandemic. I, I'm, if I'm not mistaken, you had to postpone the exhibition. Um, and how was it to prepare this retrospective? You'll be showing around 100 works 
So it's quite exciting. And I wanted you to talk a bit about that. Yeah, uh, it's, it's such a big question. I mean, we started working around three years ago. Yeah. And certainly in a much more focused way with loan requests, you know, looking at the finalizing the list of works and then going towards loan requests in the past two years. Uh, the pandemic has been certainly very difficult in terms of practical and financial impediments and the inability to move. I did a very good trip to Portugal a year and a half ago nearly uh, when I met Katerina and so many other truly wonderful curators and researchers in Lisbon and Portugal. And it was such an exciting trip to look at the wonderful collections uh, across the country, but also to just have the opportunity to discuss the work with so many experts who have engaged with their work uh, for a very long time and have been looking after the work. And yeah, Casa de Historias is one of those truly wonderful settings. Um, it was very sad not to be able to return to Portugal and do more primary research. So yeah, there were certainly some very sad setback. We've been at the same time incredibly lucky with lenders uh, in the UK, in Portugal and beyond who have been incredibly generous and are lending to us despite all the worries and uh, uncertainties. And I just hope they will feel rewarded. I believe if you feel you know Polar Eagle, you will still have an extraordinary number of surprises. We have some really wonderful loans, many works that are very well known, uh, but also many others that have very rarely been seen in public, if ever. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And uh, they are uh, shown in a loosely chron chronological development that takes you across six, 60 years of work. And I believe really truly show how still fresh, raw and exciting her work is. So yeah, very much look forward to the opening. Uh, still of course installing all the way to the opening on the 5th to 7th of July. Mm -hmm almost almost around the corner right <laughs> um so i've shared the the link from casa dos Historios, so Thank you me. are more than welcome to 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 have a look and know more about our museum and also i want to share about i want to share the link from uh the state's exhibition so so you can have more information about retrospective um I'm um, not sure if, I don't think we have any questions, so we have very shy audience, <laughs> but I wanted, I think, to, to finish, um, I wanted you to also share, uh, if you had the time to, to, to look at uh, the selected artists uh, that are showing alongside Paul Rego, Selena Palman, Cliff and Brad, uh, I would like you to, to share also your perspective around uh, their works or um, um, their narratives uh, and, and uh, how relevant are these, uh, these differences between, between generations in a way. So feel free if you want to, to share something about them. Well, um, I, I enjoyed very much coming to know the work of Anna Palma. Um, which um, strikes me as horribly poignant in terms of the physicality of the, some of the images. Um, and she's linked um, uh, that she intends um, in the images. But I must say, I've only managed to see a few. Um, and they immediately make me think about the abortion images of Tanafi. So I feel that there's a lot of blood, a lot of pain, a lot of suffering in them. I'd like to know her work much better. But that was the, the trigger that it's, they set off in my mind, that kind of um, uh, anguish relating to the female body. 
Yes, it is very much about struggling. Um, and uh, yeah, you should definitely um, look more into Anna's work. It's really strong as well and, and provocative in a way. It has also some, some very strong feminist uh, um, advances. Okay, so I think that, um, uh, yes, it, well, it's on time. <laughs> it's literally on time. And we are just having some, some, some messages like uh, from Gemma, thank you to everyone for such an insightful discussion. From Lorenzo Bellinger, thank you, so interesting. Um, it's been a wonderful show. Um, I'm now looking forward to Fate's retrospective. <laughs> And then Mathilde Rock, love this. Thank you so much. So I guess that uh, with with these uh, with these messages, I, I just want to really thank you for for being here today, for sharing your perspectives and uh, your knowledge about about Paula's work. Um, and and yes, I guess I guess that's it. Thank you so much for being here for contributing. Okay. For such a good conversation i would i would go on for hours but we can't so <laughs> thanks very much for the invitation it's been very thank good you. getting to know you thank you yes. it's a pleasure. okay thank you so much have a lovely afternoon thank you thank you thanks <laughs>